song. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Last year it was Mario. This oh, year yeah, is that's the right. wedding song. <laughs> I wonder so what next year is going to be. This is one of the high. Oh, there's a next year. Did it's you hear that, everybody? More, more formal. <laughs> I might not get invited back. <laughs> well, this is one of the highlights. The of nice my... guy, the nice guy that welcomed us. He said, "Last year, I, I told you to be yourself. This year, I'd like to give you a new advice. Whatever you do, don't be yourself." <laughs> <laughs> oh, he saw the he saw the be real. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks so much for coming. It's always, it's always a pleasure to spend time with Jensen, and uh, I hope you get a chance to grab him here or there where you can uh, the next couple of days while he's around. Um, I always learn so many things. Uh, let me ask you just to start this off. What have you been doing for the last year in AI? Well, last year in AI, so first of all, um, you, guys should, you guys should observe something that's really important. This year, the Turing Award, the Turing Award, went to, the, the Nobel Prize of Computer Science went to uh, three people who made a profound contribution to modern AI and the advancement of deep learning. Mm. Bengio, Hinton, and Lacun, all three of them made tremendous contributions and they were awarded to Turing Award. Uh, the takeaway from that is, is this is probably not a fad. That, that somehow deep learning and this form of data-driven approach of developing software, where software and the computer is writing software by itself, uh, this form of AI is likely uh, to have great profound impact. I think that's a big deal. Uh, there's a few things that I learned this year. <clears throat> um, you know, we've been working a lot in deep learning and we're going deeper and deeper in deep learning. And something happened this year that I'm pretty sure when we look back on uh, is going to become the ImageNet uh, of natural language understanding. The, the approach of uh, uh, language understanding called transformer, uh, this new approach of um, uh, understanding language has, has uh, turned out to have been successful in many, many ways. Summarization of text, uh, questions and understanding, of course, natural language understanding. Uh, we're gonna see some really, really significant breakthroughs uh, in the coming years. And so I would, I would keep an eye on natural language processing, NLP. I think this is the image net motion moment. The next five years, we're gonna see some gigantic breakthroughs. Um, I, I'm incredibly excited about physics-inspired, uh, physics-informed, uh, physics-integrated neural networks, where, where parts of the neural network, um, uh, the parts of the layers are partial differential equations. And um, whether it's on the input side, feeding into neural networks, or on the, out, the neural networks feeding into partial differential equations, uh, I think we're gonna see the fusion of computational and data-driven science. We're seeing some really big breakthroughs there. So, so I'm excited about those things. How do you think that'll first apply itself uh, to the real world? Okay, let's see. Uh, instead, of, instead of doing molecular dynamic simulations, uh, from, uh, from uh, Newtonian physics mm -hmm. uh, and particles, uh, we might uh, decide to uh, do some physics on some parts of it and use neural networks on some parts of it. Uh, very, very large scale weather simulations mm. uh, where the partial differential equations are inferred uh, on some level and comp computed on some level or combined. Uh, you, you, could use, you could use traditional methods as ground truth to I teach see. the neural networks. I see. And um, all of a sudden, you could, you could do a weather simulation on a, on a scale that's uh, unthinkable in the past. Uh, quantum chemistry. Uh, you could, you could uh, fuse the two methods and get a speed up of 1,000 times, 10,000 times. It's, it's almost unthinkable, the, you know, the, the, um, the progress that's being made. Instead of one, one field of science or the other, it's really the fusing of the mm. two. Uh, today's announcement with Adam. Using, yeah, tell us about that. That's right. Near, uh, well, let's see. Uh, the, the Atom Consortium, uh, as, you, as you know, has been trying to create a new form of computation, a new method of computation to uh, augment the discovery of drugs, to accelerate the discovery of drugs. And so at some point, there's molecular dynamic simulation. But before that, you use a neural network um, trained from a large body of ground truth to to uh, filter through the large uh, combinations of, of, uh, of molecules to decide which one are worthwhile to simulate 
and then which ones beyond that are worthwhile to go do um, uh, simulation or real testing, in vitro uh, testing on. And so, so that method of using neural networks not to predict the outcome, but to reduce the, uh, the focus of the experimentation ultimately That's can accelerate, accelerate drug discovery. Such really, really clever methods like this is happening all over, all over, all over the world. And, and I think that, that on the first principled basis at the fundamental level, uh, what's really happening is that data-driven science is now the fourth pillar of scientific discovery. Oh. You know, where we have theoretical, uh, the way that Einstein did it. You know, I could just imagine Einstein just, he sat there at his desk, he was probably mostly sleeping, and he closes his eyes and he does some, some you know, thought experiments from, th from first principle theory and uh, discovers what he discovers. And then there's the, the experimental methods, the Newtonian methods. There's the computational methods, which is the methods that we know today, simulation-based methods. And now there's gonna be data-driven methods, which fuses some of those methods together uh, it'll be the fourth pillar, and I think it's it's really powerful. So, how do you take? How does a company like Nvidia not go too far up the stack? And we're so how do you, serious. How do you arbitrage? And I, I just feel like I feel like that's the longest period of time <laughs> in a week since I've been that serious. <laughs> we'll switch in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, I'm not coming back. This, this, I don't like this party. <laughs> So how do you? This how do you? So serious here. The things you've described seems like they would apply to a lot of different domains. So how do you understand broad enough about these different domains? Like you just talked about, Adam, we could easily have a deep dive into autonomous vehicles. How do you allow this kind of arbitrage between these very diverse disciplines? Use that same fourth pillar, if you will. How do you? How do you handle all of that? Well, it, it, turn, it turns out it turns out that that um, one one of our one of our jobs and, and yours is too, Keith. We we try to find some universal truth about the way we do things, mm. and if we could discover a universal truth about what's happening in the world, um, then then the company could build it build upon it as a foundation. And one of the, one of the universal truths we we discovered recently is is uh, this data driven approach uh, to writing software. Writing software that that uh, that quite frankly no humans can write, and so we discovered this 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 foundational uh, new technology we call deep learning or machine learning uh, about seven eight years ago, and and we realized it was three things, and this was this was this was the trans this transformative moment for the company, that in the future the way that software is going to be written won't be just engineers typing on a keyboard. Uh, from everything that we've learned and all of our imagination and all of our training, somehow we codify these algorithms. Either we derive them um, from first, first combination of multiple first principles, uh, uh, sciences, or through heuristics. Um, that, that approach is going to be augmented by something else. And this, this machine learning approach with three pillars says, one, it's because of the large amount of data that we now have combined with new algorithm innovations called deep learning that is, that is re repeatable. It's AI that's repeatable. AI that you and I can engage that's repeatable. Uh, and third, uh, that requires a, a lot, lot of computation to bring all this stuff together to write the software by itself. The, the, the observation, therefore, translated to, we need to be a data-driven company that a company like ourselves, if we, want to be, if we want to take advantage of this capability, needs to have a data strategy. How do we capture the data? How do we figure out what data to use and what data not to use? How do we create clever ideas of what kind of data do we fuse together, called features, to use to train our models? What kind of infrastructure do we need to create? Uh, until now, our company really didn't have supercomputing infrastructure. We now have one of the world's largest supercomputers. And um, I think we're, we're well within the top 100, probably in the top 50 supercomputing companies in the world. And how do we create our storage system, our, create our storage architecture? How do we develop all the software on top? What's the methodology, the tools that we use to plumb the software from wherever we collect it from, largely the edge, you know, in the case of cars or ground truth, or whatever it is, how do we get this data piped through the company, compute it in a way that's efficient, and get results back into the engineer's hands on a, on a fast enough basis? How do we validate and simulate the results? Um, all of this transformed our company, frankly. 
And so do you use this for yeah. chips, for design, for fabrication? We use this at everything. We use this for designing chips. We use this for designing systems, uh, uh, improving our yields. We use this for computer graphics. Uh, one of the things that, as you know, um, we, we're a computer graphics company, and we use the GPUs to create deep learning and enable deep learning. Now we use deep learning to go back and reinvent computer graphics. Mm. For example, there's this new field of computer graphics that we've made real time called ray tracing. But even with all of the computation we can do now and all the hardware that we, we bring to bear and the new algorithms we've created, we still can't do ray tracing fast enough. We can only generate enough samples to, to create essentially you know, kind of a speckle of images on the screen. And so for everything else, we've taught a neural network how to infer the rest of the scene. So we give it a few dots and it figured out the rest of it from all of the training that we've done for it. Uh, we use it for animation. And so we taught uh, characters how to animate. We have, you know, one of, the, one of my favorite places for robots is in uh, virtual reality. Mm. The first place where you're gonna have interactive, realistic, um, avatars that seem like they're AIs and they can interact with you, they can, they, uh, they, they, they're living, breathing AIs inside a virtual reality environment will, will be likely in video games. So let me ask you, because I'm going to ask the next question, but the question before is, let's go back to 2016. Yeah. If I was to ask you then what was going to happen in the next three years, what did you see that was right and what did you kind of miss? What, was, what happened that you didn't expect? Cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see it? <laughs> I, ne I never imagined that you could plug our computer, our chip into the wall and money would squirt out. <laughs> didn't see it coming. It, it, it squirted out really fast. <laughs> and then I didn't see that it would end. <laughs> when it came, I, I, at first I was surprised. Um, I didn't think that it would last. And then after a while, I, I wished it would last forever. <laughs> okay, I, I confessed. Um, <laughs> that was truthful. So, so okay, so that's, that's, that's Oh, no, but what, some, of the, some of the things, what, what, did, what were some of the good things that we did? Okay, so, so for example, uh, uh, data science. We realize that deep learning is an algorithm, a body of, uh, body of algorithms, and it's part of a larger field called data science. Mm -hmm. That was a great observation. That changed everything for our company. Uh, we focused on, on um, ingest, ingesting, ingesting data, um, processing data, uh, doing data analytics, petabytes and petabytes of data coming from different places uh, for us to, if you will, wrangle with our GPUs. Super computing problem, really, really hard to do. We developed a ton of software for that. It's called Rapids, and it's uh, open sourced. You guys should really take a look at it. It's probably even more important than all the work that we've done for deep learning. Uh, we dedicated a bunch of resources on machine learning, a larger body of work beyond convolution neural networks. And so we worked on a lot of stuff with machine learning. And, um, and then lastly, we figured out that, that it's not just about data centers. It's about data centers and clouds and the edge working together. That unless you could figure out a way as a company to get data from the edge into your company, create software from it, and then getting the AI back out to the edge and having the system work continuously, the work that we announced today, the partnership that we announced today, essentially, we've taken the AI and we put it out at the edge. Yeah. There's a reason why the AI needs to be out at the edge. If it's in the, in the context of a robot or a car, it's because the latency is too important, the context, the contextual information of the environment around it can't afford to go back to the cloud and come back. In the case of radiology, the privacy of the data is too important, the expertise is physical, it's in the radiologist, it's local, the data that they have is local. The expertise tends to be local. It's hard to put everything back into the cloud. And so you want to put now computing at the edge mm. so that the AI could be created at the edge, but then federated at the cloud somehow and then brought back to the edge. So, that edge computing was really a big deal. So let's talk about that. that that's a really interesting concept. So it, do you think it's domain specific as to where the intelligence should be? 
edge cloud back forth? Does that depend on the use case? I, yeah, the, the amount of it depends on the use case. Okay. The amount of it depends on the use case. In the case of a, in the case of, in the case of a self-driving car, the amount of computation we have to put at the edge is a lot. And the reason for that is because they're just, it's traveling at 75 miles and 100 miles an hour, and, and everything is moving. And so the perception is computationally intensive. We use, multi, we use multi-sensors. We, we, we fuse, we do sensor fusion. It's no different than radiology. You guys do sensor fusion. Sometimes you use CT, sometimes you use mm -hmm. MRI, sometimes you use ultrasound, sometimes you use the combination of all of it. Mm -hmm. And so we do the same thing in self-driving cars. We, sent, we fuse the sensor. Uh, we use different algorithms. Uh, you do the same, surprisingly, in, in radiology. We use a, a concept called redundancy and diversity. You can't just have one uh, intelligence make a decision. You, you try to have multiple in, intelligences make, the, make a decision. And you hope that the approach that they use is, is diverse. It's not exactly the same. Uh, for example, in the case of radiology, the work that we, did, we just announced today, the doctor is one is, is the initial body of intelligence. Now it's augmented by another form of intelligence. It's now redundant and diverse. Redundant and diverse. The two of them will augment each other, and of course, we're gonna have other and other augmentations. Like for example, um, if, uh, if um, uh, another doctor from another place uh, were to use uh, their data, and they created uh, an AI that was, that was uh, very effective, uh, instead of fusing the two, you might decide to ensemble the two. Just have the two of them sit next to each other and, and both inform you uh, and the doctor uh, about, about the diagnostics and so. One of the announcements that, that uh, Jensen's talking about today was this notion of democratization of AI. A little bit what I talked about in the last session was this complexity of being able to move data around in healthcare. So one notion is to say if we created a solution here at, at, and we did it at uh, Partners, and we shared that with Ohio State in the model form, and then Ohio State took it and optimized it for their data and got the accuracy back up again. So is that, well first, is that the case in any other domain? Or do you think it'll be something that, that has to happen in healthcare because the data can't move around like it, like it does in other areas? In fact, it's, it's um, almost exactly the same parallel in a self-driving car. It's just your challenges are much harder. Mm. In the case of a self-driving car, let me just give you an example. Um, you have a network of cars, and um, uh, what one car experiences is not exactly the same as another car experience, because one, one car could be mostly in a city, the other one could be mostly in a, a rural environment, another car could be in China, another car could be in Europe, another one car could be in the United States. And so the roads are slightly different. However, uh, every single time, every single time there was a, if you will, mistake, and, and the driver were to intervene, it becomes a new label. Oh, I see. It's exactly the same as a radiologist with this AI tool that we're working on together. You put it in the hands of the radiologist. If it's exactly the right diagnosis, then big thumbs up. If it's not, then the AI will say, how would you adjust it? And with a small tweak, the doctor could say, this is, this is the right segmentation or this is the right identification. And all of a sudden, that new piece of information goes back to improve the overall network. The same thing with a self-driving car. There's a sign, it says stop. You didn't recognize it as stop because maybe it's in, in I just bought a company in, in, uh, in Israel, so maybe it's in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And so it's backwards and upside down. And, and um, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Do you guys know why it's, up, it's backwards and upside down? Because this language is so old, it was chiseled. And therefore, it has to come from this side. We, no, it's not that interesting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so, okay, so a couple of questions with this. So, when a car driver says, I've made a mistake and I'll... You just want to talk about radiology. I, I, no, Every time I see yeah. Keith, he just wants to talk about one thing. So I'm driving he pretends to care about my work. He <laughs> pretends to care about my work. He only uses my work to inform his work. So I'm, so I'm driving down a car... He only cares about up, radiology and healthcare. I'm holding up an MRI. And <laughs> Guilty as charged. So... So with autonomous vehicles, though, if there's millions of drivers making mistakes or the yeah. car's making a mistake, yeah. is that all coming back up to a cloud somewhere? And, and, and I assume that answer is yes. So let me ask yeah. the real question is, 
How do you then make these on-the-fly changes? How do you make sure that that upgrade is approved? Who do you have to go through regulatory, all of that kind of stuff, to have all those things happen? You've got to go through the whole loop again. You, you take all of that data that's no different than the originally labeled data. Okay. It's just new ground truth. And then you've got to go through the entire path, and including validation, including testing, so this including simulation. So it's not truly continuous learning where no. on the fly there's changes. No, 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 that's right. It won't be, it won't be continuous. However, the data will be continuous. The yeah. loop will be continuous. Right. And here's the big insight. If you just describe this, if you just describe this, in the future, not only will your software be software defined because it's getting updated all the time, and the capability will be defined by the software. So your car needs to be programmable. Your medical instrument needs to be programmable. Uh, your, your doctors needs to be in front of a programmable system so that it could run all of these interesting neural networks as they come out. But the more important, the more important thing is this. Your company needs to be software defined. Yeah, right. The whole company needs to be software defined. In the future, all of our companies are gonna become, from a block diagram perspective, an AI. <laughs> our companies, if you draw this, the architecture and the block diagram of today's modern AI companies who are building AI products, it looks just like an AI computer. <laughs> Identical. The whole path, the whole loop of data coming in that the company perceives reasons, plans action, and then takes action, actuates. It's just one of the outer loops or the inner loops of what is ultimately uh, the software defined product. And that flow, that flow from volumes, petabytes and petabytes of data coming in, figuring out how much of the petabytes of data you should reject, ideally 99.999%, oh. because your AI is so smart to realize, I've read this before. I know this already. I don't have to keep learning multiplication because I get it already. Reject it, reject it, reject it, so you can focus on only the things that you need to learn from the things that you need to learn, still gigantic amounts of data. That goes through data analytics, data preparation, feature engineering. It goes through machine learning of different types. It goes through validation. It goes through simulation. Eventually, you put it, on, you put it in experimentation. When it finally passes, you OTA it out to the products, you, that loop continuously. Yep. That is basically the loop of artificial intelligence, and the future companies are going to be software-defined companies. So back to radiology. Yeah, I'm I'm I know. I know, you're killing me. I'm you're kidding. killing me. No, no, so this, so. <laughs> I love radiology, are you kidding me? <laughs> so last, That's why you and I know each other. So last week, uh, FDA came out with a white paper. Yeah. And it was comforting for me to see that they're actually considering continuous learning. They know that this is a problem. And I champion actually their solution as opposed to just decreasing this pre-market uh, regulatory approval process and actually putting in place a post-market anal analysis. So to be able to kind of surveil these things in the wild, looking at these algorithms and saying, things change. You know, our modalities, MRI and CAT scans change. Right, patient data changes. So if, even if these algorithms stay the same, things coming at them are gonna look different. So it's probably not enough to control an algorithm on the way in, you also have to monitor it after it gets out there. Do you think that's, that's the way to go? Is that, is that similar to other domains? Has, has automotive looked at that and said, well, we never thought that it was gonna rain uh, you know, on a mountain, and now it is, and so something's happened and we need to reconsider this? One of my favorite things it was, a, it, was a, it was a really weird thing when I first saw it a long time ago. It was, my, it, 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 it was groundbreaking for me uh, from, and from a way that I think about, about developing products was the concept of beta. If you look at cloud software, it stays in beta for years <laughs> as millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people use it. Frankly, I think it's still in beta. Every single cloud application that we know is in beta. <laughs> and the reason for that is because it's changing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that software, a software product will be shrink wrapped, ended with Windows Vista. It was the last product that I know. No, I, no, I, I, don't, I didn't mean that as a, it was a milestone product. 
And, and uh, many of us, uh, including myself, uh, worked on Vista uh, for five years. And the reason for that, the reason why it was such an important observation isn't, isn't the fact, isn't what you think it is. It's because it finally became such a gigantic body of work, and it needed to be a gigantic body of work. You can't do by gigantic body of works like that anymore. Mm, I see. You can't shrink wrap it. There is no period of, hey, guys, hit the button, print 10 million of them. <laughs> it doesn't exist. The world, the future world of software, the, our company will be software defined, our product is software defined, our company is programmable, the software, the product is software programmable, and OTA is happening all the time. We're doing QA all the time. I see. And so if we can't get our arms around that idea, we won't get the benefits of the, the new exponential, the new Moore's law, the new Moore's law, and it's happening. You guys, more, silicon is not advancing at the state of Moore's law. The amount of data plus silicon plus algorithm is moving at the rate of Moore's law. Yes. And you, you mentioned this earlier in your talk, there is no question that we now have software that is superhuman. It's able to do one specific task better than we can. Well, literally five years ago, it was dumb as a brick. <laughs> and so somewhere between five years, it became better than any human in the world. So if that's not Moore's law, it's Moore's law squared probably or cubed. But there's no question that these type of software that combines several factors, it is data driven, it is algorithmically learned, algorithmically written on a supercomputer this combination, this cauldron in this three things happening, we're gonna see out amazing results. So, so I'd be remiss if I didn't, in front of this crowd, ask you, um, and I'll pause just to make it torture you a little bit. What, so you've probably got a better vision than anybody. What's gonna happen in the next five years? If you've got that kind of hockey stick curve and beyond chips and in, into intelligence on these things, what are the capabilities, and, and how do we prepare for that? How do you prepare for that? How do you prepare the company for that? Well, the, the, the thing that we're doing is just making sure that, number one, um, we, my job is to create the conditions by which the company can succeed. Create the conditions by which the company can succeed. I can't guarantee it succeeds. I can only create the conditions by which it succeeds. Th there's no question that velocity, agility, um, in my field of work is vital to, to survival. It's, it's completely existential. And so the thing that I have to do is make sure that the things that we just talked about, um, that we're a data-driven company, that we're a software-defined company, that the computing infrastructure of our company is leading edge, world-class, that we understand the pipeline flow of data coming in, curated, wrangled, mm. learned, validated, simulated, tested, OTA'd, this process, this loop is absolutely world class. So I have to create the conditions by which our company understands that. I have to have, make sure I've got the right expertise in the company. Now, the rest of it is just strategy, and strategies are changing all the time, and, and um, uh, you know, we're, we're smart, and we can, we can stay on top of that. The thing that I, I would say that in the next five years, a couple of things, a couple of things I, I expect to have um, tremendous breakthroughs. Uh, and and we, we talked about it at the beginning. I expect that natural language processing will surprise everybody. Our ability to have an agent go off and read a whole bunch of documents, summarize it for us, uh, is, is going to be fantastic. Our ability to, uh, the next time we do search, not only would it give us a whole body of links, it, it will actually come back and, and summarize what it learned and then give me a body of links if I wanted to go learn some more. Now, is that separate from conversation, though? Uh, I, think, I think conversational, conversational language processing will also surprise us. Now, of course, the, it, it learned from a whole bunch of patterns, so, so is it soulful conversation? I doubt it, um, but, but um, uh, it'll, it'll hold our attention. Hmm. You know, it'll tell us a story. Uh, one of the things that's really amazing is uh, OpenAI with their GP2, it's called One Shot Learning, basically read through, I think it's eight million web pages or eight million documents, and um, uh, it could complete a sentence. 
<laughs> meaning it could figure out what is the next word. And once it figures out the next word, it could figure out the next word. Once it figures out the next word, it could figure out the next word. And so the way to think about that is you give it a seed of a word. So for example, you go, you know, Jen Jensen goes to Boston. It'll finish that story. <laughs> and and, um, I, and, and it's, it's, it, it, because it's gonna, it, it might be contextually aware because it knows my calendar, it knows a few things, it knows that you and I get together once a year. It, it, it might just says Jensen's gonna go uh, to, to Boston to what he calls the, the WMF, and um, <laughs> what do you guys call it? WMIF. WMIF, okay. All right, so we're, we're gonna need to work on this, the name of this conference, otherwise known as WMIF. Uh, Got that, Chris? <laughs> WMIF, who does that? <laughs> C-H-R-I-S does. C-H. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's good humor. Keith. So That's good humor. Okay. So last year, um, you I'm starting to really rub off. <laughs> so last year you mentioned, we were talking about autonomous vehicles and the challenges that automotive companies had. And you said you spent a ton of money, ton of money on people annotating things, right? Lanes, stop signs, pedestrians, cars, da, da 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 Is that still a challenge for AI? And is that ever gonna go away? Or how do you, how does a company like yours approach that challenge into the other domains? We're not un annotating cars and lanes anymore. Uh, we're now annota um, annotating scenes. Me, what does that mean? scenarios. So give me a, what does that and mean? And so, so for example, intersections, as it turns out, are really tricky. Mm. They don't always have lights. They don't always have stop signs. They don't always look like intersections. Somehow you and I know that. Yeah. Yeah. We drive up to an intersection and go, eh. Not my last Uber driver. Yeah, I'm not going to fall for that. I'm not going to drive right through it. I'm not falling for it. It says, come on, it's OK. No, I'm not falling for it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down. And so somehow we figure it out. Yeah. Uh, circumstances, uh, we, we, we annotate those. Um, uh, we, um, Can you have AI annotate for you? Yeah. We, we so all, explain that. Uh, so for example, uh, we, we, uh, we, use, um, uh, we use AI that, that annotates um, cars by itself. And so we just go, dink, that's a car, and it goes, oh yeah, I recognize this car, and it draws a bounding box around it. And, and um, because, because if, if you can figure it out, we could teach an AI how to figure it out. Got it. Okay, and so uh, we do the same thing with the work that we're doing with you guys. Medical right? imaging. Yeah, yeah, medical imaging, because uh, you, you start out with, with a small uh, a, a lead, and it finishes the rest in a sentence for you. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. It does. You give it a little bit of a hint, right. and it finishes the rest of the sentence for you. It's no different. So you so find a piece of the heart, and it fills in the rest of the heart. Finishes the rest of the sentence for you. Right. Right. I see what you're saying. Instead of instead of in language, it's in a visual world. The, the technology is very similar. So you can use AI to train AI. We use AI. Sense. We use AI to go train AI. Um, and then wherever the differences are, where we take over, this is really where where we now add a ton of value. All the brute force, the grunt work is now done by the AI. The hard stuff is where we get involved. Mm. How do we teach an AI how to understand this circumstance that is, gosh, kind of really subtle? Now, now you're, you have to apply some real intelligence. And this is where, this is where AI is going to go. You ask, you know, what's going to happen? We're going to, have, we're going to have AI do a lot of our grunt work for us. It's, they're doing it already. For example, they go through our spam. They go through our junk mail. Uh, if it wasn't because of, of AIs doing that, uh, we'd be flooded with, 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 uh, with junk mail. And so somebody is already cleaning that up for us. Mm -hmm. Now it's even sorting between things that, that it's learned in Outlook that I'd be interested in, things that they call it focused, and things that are background. Pretty soon, it's going to prioritize my email for me. Mm -hmm. Because it knows what are the ones that I go to naturally or spend more time in or take actions from. Keith Dryers will be first. Keith Dryers right up on top. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've gone a little over time. So Chris, CHRIS is right there. Um, any closing thoughts? I, 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 think, I think that, that um, remember what AI is. Remember ultimately what we're talking about. You know, are we going to harness AI? Should we put AI to work? Uh, is um, uh, how, do sh how should we think about AI in the context of our company? Remember what AI is. AI is software. Should we use software in the future of our work? 
The answer is absolutely. This software just happens to be magic software in the <laughs> sense that this is software that writes software. Yep. And one of the things that, that, is, that is most, most, uh, most powerful for me as a tool is to realize ultimately what was the purpose of software. Software's fundamental purpose is automation. And AI, therefore, is the automation of automation. And if we can harness the automation of automation, imagine what good we could do. That's, That's it. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jensen.